Hello everyone, welcome to Shivam's Biology. In this video, we will talk about photosynthesis. This video is meant for those who are preparing for NEET, AMS and various other pre-medical entrance examinations. So let's see what we are going to discuss in the video. Firstly, we will introduce the process of photosynthesis. Uh, actually, all of you know that what is photosynthesis, so it will be a very basic introduction. After that, we will see the historical background of photosynthesis, the site of photosynthesis that is chloroplast and its structure. After this, we will discuss about the photosynthetic pigments in detail like uh, chlorophyll, xanthophyll and various other pigments. After this, we will discuss the absorption and action spectra, the Angelman's experiment, the quantum yield of photosynthesis, Emerson raindrop experiment and enhancement experiment, photosystems 1 and 2, photosystems 1 and 2. After that, we will start understanding the mechanism of photosynthesis, including the light reaction, dark reaction, and after that we will continue about photoaspiration c4 pathway and then we will compare those plants that have c3 pathway and those having the c4 pathway then we will discuss the cam pathway that is present in the xerophytes mainly and after that we will summarize the whole process of photosynthesis and then we will discuss those factors that affect the process of photosynthesis so stay tuned with us and this video is going to be a complete video on the process of photosynthesis so let's start here uh, also you can uh, take notes or uh, screenshots of the video and keep on learning photosynthesis is the process by which the green plants synthesize organic food with the help of CO2, H2O in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll. Photosynthesis converts light energy into the chemical energy of food. Let's talk about this statement. Photosynthesis converts light energy into the chemical energy of food. Here the light energy comes from sun and it is converted into the chemical energy that is stored in the food that is the glucose or uh, we can say sugars. <coughs> Actually, on earth, sun is the main source of energy and whatever form of energy we see around us is obtained from sun. And photosynthesis is the main process which fixes this which fixes this energy or converts this energy uh, into usable form for us and the every ecosystem and every ecosystem that we see around us gets energy from sun what is the chemical equation for the process of photosynthesis you have already known that uh, co2 and h2o combine in the presence of chlorophyll chlorophyll is the pigment which help to uh, capture sunlight we will see in detail chlorophyll and sunlight is essential for this process and these are combined to form glucose and some H2 is also released actually when we will see the process in detail you will learn that here actually 12 h2 you can uh, at other places you can see another uh, equation like 6 co2 plus 6 h2o is converted into c6 h12o6 plus 6 o2 now here there is a confusion that whether it should be 12 or 6 we will clear in the next upcoming sections of this video so keep on learning let's proceed to the next section
here you can see that the whole process in the whole process of photosynthesis the one section is you can divide the whole process into two sections the first one is this and the second one is this here in the first process you can see that light energy comes which helps the light reactions to occur and during the light reactions H2O is used oxygen is evolved and the process produces ATP and NADPH which are used during the next part of this reaction that is the Calvin cycle here ATP and NADPH are used to produce sugar from CO2 the whole process occurs inside chloroplast of the plant cells and inside chloroplast we will see what things are present in the next sections so let's continue here firstly we will discuss about the historical backgrounds of photosynthesis after that we will discuss the thing in detail you can take a screenshot of this historical background also there is a large history related with photosynthesis which you can find in various other books like your NCRT and other textbooks Stephen Hales in 1727 uh, firstly said that green plants require sunlight for their nutrition there are various facts that you can uh, learn by your own I don't think that uh, there is much to explain here so I'll proceed further here now we will learn about the site of photosynthesis that is the chlorophyll uh, sorry chloroplast here the most active photosynthetic cells in higher plants are the mesophyll cells let's learn what are the mesophyll cells what are the mesophyll cells if we see the cross section of any leaf what we see there are two coverings that are called epidermis the upper epidermis is called adaxial epidermis and the epidermis that is present on the lower surface of leaf is called abaxial epidermis inside these there are a lot of cells present in between these two layers and these all cells are called mesophyll mesophyll can be of two types towards the adaxial epidermis lies the palisade mesophyll actually it is the arrangement which gives the term palisade and towards the abaxial epidermis that is towards the lower surface of leaf lies the uh, spongy mesophyll so these mesophyll cells are the main site of photosynthesis now inside the mesophyll cells inside the mesophyll cells chloroplast are the actual site of photosynthesis so let's see what are chloroplast and here you can see the structure of chloroplast it is a three-dimensional structure and the chloroplast is cut down here to expose thalaquides and other things inside it here you can see that chloroplast is composed of two membranes one is the outer membrane one is the outer membrane and the other one is inner membrane other one is the inner membrane so it is double layered double layered envelope which encloses the chloroplast inside chloroplast there is a fluid present and the fluid present inside chloroplast is called a stroma within stroma there are various membranous structures 
you can see here stacked structures and if we see one of these like uh, I will take one this is called thylakoid this is called thylakoid and thylakoids are stacked over each other here you can see many thylakoids are stacked over each other one stack of thylakoid let's take this stack one stack of thylakoid is called grana one stack of thylakoid is called grana chloroplast also contain its own genetic material that you have studied in chapter cell it is its own dna and it also contains various other things here we will focus mainly upon those things that are related directly related with the uh, process of photosynthesis so thylakoid here you can say thylakoid here the disc like structure it is thylakoid and the liquid present here is called stroma if we see thylakoid in detail actually thylakoid is a membrane structure which contains a membrane and empty space inside the empty space inside thylakoid is called a lumen of thylakoid actually lumen is a very common word in biology and the empty space inside an organ is called lumen and here is the membrane of thylakoid this is the membrane so let's see some other things about the whole process here's some uh, let's take to another slide slide of photosynthesis here mesophyll cells contain a large number of chloroplast mesophyll cell contain a large number of chloroplast which contain specialized light absorbing pigments here the light absorbing pigments are actually present on the surface of the membrane of thylakoid you have already learned about thylakoid so these pigments are present on the surface of thylakoid membrane you have already already learned that chloroplast is a double membrane structure it contains fluid called stroma within stroma a membranous network of thylakoids is present a stack of thylakoid is called grana in plural it is called grana adjacent grana are connected by unstacked membrane called the stroma lamellae let's see what is stroma lamellae it will be clear here through the diagram actually you can see here stroma lamellae is uh, here you can see this is one grana and this is the another grana both of these grana this granum and this granum both of these are connected with this unstacked part this is called the stroma lamellae you can find another stroma lamellae here which connect various grana these are the stroma lamellae so you have become familiar with the structure of chloroplast you have become familiar with the structure of chloroplast and we will proceed further now we will see the photosynthetic pigments what are photosynthetic pigments these are those substances these are those substances that have ability to absorb light at specific wavelengths this is very meaningful thing at specific wavelengths various pigments can capture sunlight uh, not in not the whole part of sunlight but various wavelengths of sunlight you already know that sunlight contains uh, various other colors of light like violet indigo blue etc so different pigments are specialized to absorb different parts of sunlight that is the specific wavelengths of sunlight the ability of a pigment to absorb various wavelengths of light can be measured with spectrophotometer this can be asked in your neat exam what is spectrophotometer so you should learn it the main types of photosynthetic pigments are chlorophyll 
carotenoids and phycobilins. Let's see all of these in detail. So we'll proceed further. Chlorophylls. Chlorophyll is a green pigment you already know which traps solar radiation and converts it into chemical energy. It is the main pigment which helps in the process of photosynthesis. The molecule of chlorophyll contains of a head which is called porphyrin head and uh, we will now see the whole structure. Let's firstly see the theory. The porphyrin head has four rings called pyrrole rings with one central magnesium atom it is very important the atom which is present in the core of uh, head porphyrin head is the magnesium atom and magnesium atom is surrounded by four pyrrole rings these rings contain four carbon atom and one nitrogen one nitrogen atom each and the other thing present in the structure of chlorophyll is the phytol tail. It contains a long chain of hydrocarbon and the another thing is that phytol tail is absent in chlorophyll C. Chlorophyll C is a type of chlorophyll we will see uh, in upcoming sections. Firstly see the structure of chlorophyll molecule here. You can see the structure of chlorophyll molecule and the most common chlorophyll that is chlorophyll A is here. Here the thing you don't need to learn the whole structure. Uh, you don't need to cram up this structure. Just a few things you need to learn here. That magnesium atom is present in the center. This part, this whole part is the head and the long chain is phytotel. So here in the head, the central atom is magnesium, which is surrounded by four rings. You can see here four rings and you can see here nitrogen atoms, nitrogen atoms. And so as I told you earlier that porphyrin head contains each uh, Porphyrin head contain four pyrrole rings and each pyrrole ring contain four carbon and one nitrogen. Four carbon and one nitrogen. So let's see here. Four carbon and one nitrogen you should find here. Here is the central magnesium atom. And if we take any one ring, you can see here one nitrogen. And let's count the carbon one two three and four so each pile ring contains uh, one nitrogen and four carbon atoms uh, in previous years questions have been asked from the structure of chlorophyll molecules so sh uh, you should learn these things now we should proceed further here this is not very important for a uh, neat exam but it may be asked in some exams like AMS. So uh, you should learn the process of biosynthesis of chlorophyll. Actually the precursor of chlorophyll synthesis is glycine and succinyl coenzyme A. Glycine and succinyl coenzyme A form protochlorophyllite. After a series of reactions it is then reduced to chlorophyllite. Chlorophyllite lacks the phytol gel. When phytol gel gets attached with it, then chlorophyll is formed. And the next section is somewhat important that angiosperms, except citrus and nilumbo, require sunlight for the biosynthesis of chlorophyll. Angiosperms so can't uh, synthesize chlorophyll in the absence of sunlight. Chlorophyll, chlorophyll synthesis require light and some other here you can see some other atoms some other minerals gymnosperms bryophytes and algae can form chlorophyll even in dark so you can relate this point with this point here angiosperm cannot synthesize chlorophyll in the absence of light but gymnosperm bryophyte and algae can 
If an eosperm plant is kept in dark from its germination, it will be pale and undifferentiated. Such plants are termed as etiolated plant and the process is called etiolation. So you should learn these terms. It's not much important but you should learn. The main thing that we are going to discuss is the mechanism of photosynthesis. But before learning mechanism, you should learn the associated things. So here I am discussing about the pigments related in the process of photosynthesis. Here you can see some types of chlorophyll. Don't get bothered about the uh, large variety of chlorophyll. Here chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B is the most important types. Other are C, G, E and these are bacterial chlorophyll which are present in bacteria. Bacterial chlorophyll A and bacterial chlorophyll B. You don't need to remember the formula of all the types of chlorophyll but chlorophyll A and B are most important. You should learn about these. Chlorophyll A is bright green or blue green color and it is the most abundant type of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll B is yellow green in color. Let's proceed further. Now we will talk about carotenoids. Carotenoids are yellow, brown or orange colored pigments. These are yellow, brown or orange colored pigments. Light is not required for their synthesis. So they can be synthesized in absence of light too. They protect chlorophyll from photooxidation. Very important point. They protect chlorophyll from photooxidation. What is photooxidation? It is a type of damage which happens due to overexposure to sunlight. So, carotenoids protect chlorophyll from being uh, destroyed by the excessive amount of light. Carotenoids act as accessory pigments and trap light energy. What is accessory pigment? Actually, accessory pigments are like antenna. They form uh, antenna around the chlorophyll molecules. In the upcoming sections, we will discuss these accessory pigments and the complete organization in detail. Uh, here you should know that carotenoids actually trap light energy and transfer this energy to the chlorophyll for the process of photosynthesis. So these are known as SS3 pigments. Carotenoids are also present in flowers and fruits. These are of two types, carotenes and xanthophylls. Carotenes and xanthophyll. We should proceed from here. Firstly here we will discuss about the carotenes. Carotenes are orange yellow in color. Basic carotin is lycopene which is found in tomato, chili, rose, purple bacteria etc. It is an important point that lycopene is present in tomato and chili. You should memorize it. Questions have been asked from here. Three main isomers of carotenes alpha, beta and gamma. Beta carotene is most common. Beta carotene is most common. I think you must be aware with beta carotene. In animals, beta carotene is converted into vitamin A. Can you think here, carotene sounds like carrot and uh, you must have listened before that carrot is um, very helpful for eyesight. And yes, carrot contains beta carotene, which is converted into vitamin A in our body, and which helps uh, to keep our eyes healthy. In plants, beta carotene has roles in the synthesis of abscisic acid, which is a very important phytohormone. Let's proceed. Here, xanthophylls are brown colored pigments. And xanthophylls are oxygen derivatives of carotene, so these are formed from carotenes. Example of xanthophyll are leucine, zeaxanthin, violaxanthin, and many more. You don't need to remember all these. It's just a part of introduction before the mechanism of photosynthesis. So I'm making you familiar with these pigments. Now 
talking about FICO balance. FICO balance are found in red algae, blue green algae, and cryptomonads. These pigments are closely associated with thalaquites in the form of granules or microbodies, hence known as phycobilisomes. Phycobilisomes, if found in higher plants, is phytochrome, which has no role in photosynthesis, but used in stomatal movement, photomorphogenesis, photoperiodism, etc. So, phycobalance have direct role in photosynthesis in uh, red algae, uh, blue-green algae, and cryptomonads. Generally, phycobalance have four pyrrole rings linked to each other in linear way. Here are some types of phycobalin. These are phycocyanin, which is blue colored, phycoerythrin, red colored, and allophycocyanin, that is green colored. It was all about phycobalin pigments. Now, here comes a very important topic for your neat exam. Let's learn what is absorption spectrum. It is a graph plotting a pigment's light absorption versus wavelength. So you can see here a graph is here and in this graph we have depicted you can see here chlorophyll this graph is for chlorophyll A this graph is for chlorophyll B and this yellow colored graph is for carotenoids. Here we see just taking example of chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A shows the maximum amount of here absorption of light energy by chloroplast pigment. So the maximum amount of light absorbed by chlorophyll lies somewhat near this point. It is around this wavelength of sunlight between 400 and 500. This point you can see here that uh, chlorophyll A shows the highest amount of light energy absorbed. Here chlorophyll B shows its absorption peak at this point. And similarly carotenoids have their own absorption spectrum. So, what is absorption spectrum? It is a graph which tells us that which pigment uh, captures or traps sunlight most efficiently at which wavelength. Let's proceed. After absorption spectrum, we will learn about the action spectrum. Action spectrum is the graph showing the rate of photosynthesis at different wavelengths of light. Here you can see the rate of photosynthesis is actually determined by the amount of released oxygen. As you know that oxygen is released during the process of photosynthesis. So action spectrum is measured that at which wavelengths oxygen is evolved in which amount. Here you can see the maximum amount of oxygen evolved at two points here and here. You can see two peaks. One is this and the other one is this. So if you compare action spectrum with the absorption spectrum or superimpose these graphs here uh, just take the previous example I'm going to show you here's the absorption spectrum and if uh, we form a rough sketch above this graph it will be like uh, this and this two peaks you can see here two first peak is here and second peak is here and if we compare absorption spectrum with the action spectrum, you can also see here two peaks are present. So, um, actually the process of photosynthesis depends upon the amount of light energy absorbed by the pigments involved in it. So, absorption spectrum is related with action spectrum. Here, 
one very important point is that rate of photosynthesis is maximum in the violet blue and red region you can see here the first peak lies here near the violet blue region you can see this color spectrum and another peak lies in the region of a red color so here questions are uh, questions are asked from this point maximum rate of photosynthesis is seen in violet blue and red light and the rate of photosynthesis is minimum in green light here you can see this point is near green light why the rate of photosynthesis is minimum in green light because green light is totally reflected by the chlorophylls so it's obvious that rate of photosynthesis will be very low here now proceeding further here we will see Angelman's experiment Angelman's experiment actually he performed this experiment on a green alga cladophora and also used aerobic bacteria what he did uh, he took a prism and scattered sunlight into its component colors and passed these colors in a solution of aerobic bacteria and also took a filamentous alga cladophora in it here you can see that aerobic bacteria have accumulated in two regions in two regions you can very clearly see here and you can really relate this uh, graph this diagram with the previous diagram of action spectrum uh, maximum amount of aerobic bacteria lies here and here this also shows that listen why is this why these uh, aerobic bacteria have accumulated in such pattern that here there is no any aerobic bacteria is present and most of them are present at these two peaks why because when light is supplied this cladophora starts to perform photosynthesis since it is a green alga and obviously it will perform photosynthesis in the presence of sunlight and during photosynthesis various parts of this alga get different colors of sunlight and in those regions where violet blue color is received and a red color light is received the rate of photosynthesis will be maximum and during photosynthesis oxygen is released so maximum oxygen will be released in this region and this region these aerobic bacteria present here will accumulate themselves in these regions to receive maximum amount of oxygen so this experiment explained the amount of co2 released or rate of photosynthesis is different in different regions of uh, different wavelengths or different spectrum of sunlight proceeding further here there's another important point that is quantum yield what is quantum yield it is the number of oxygen molecules produced per quanta of light absorbed during photosynthesis what is quantum actually light has dual nature you know that particle nature can it uh, consists of various photon these are the discrete particles and there is another nature that is the wave nature here we will talking about the particles of light that are the per quanta of light the number of oxygen molecules produced per quanta of light absorbed is called quantum yield whereas the quantum of light required to release one molecule of oxygen is called quantum requirement it is known that eight quanta are required during photosynthesis to evolve one molecule thus quantum yield is there. you should just know the term what is quantum yield because you will uh, find this term in the next sections also so quantum yield is the number of oxygen molecules produced during photosynthesis per quantum of light absorbed let's proceed further here we will discuss emerson red drop experiment and enhancement effect 
What is Emerson Red Drop? Robert Emerson and C. M. Lewis exposed chlorella to monochromatic light only one wavelength at a time and measured the quantum yield. So what they did? They exposed chlorella to monochromatic light. Monochromatic mono means one, chrome means color. So monochromatic light means light consisting of any single color that is only one wavelength at a time and measured the quantum yield. They observed a sharp decrease in quantum yield at wavelengths greater than 680 nanometer. This is called a red drop. And when they exposed chlorella to both short and long wavelengths at the same time, the quantum yield increased greatly. This is called the enhancement effect. This is due to the combined effect of these short and long wavelengths of light photosynthesis increased very greatly this is called enhancement effect they concluded that there must be two different photosystems involved in photosynthesis which work together to increase the efficiency by this experiment they came to know they asserted that there must be two different systems working in the process of photosynthesis so they utilize different type of wavelengths of light and enhance the process of enhance the rate of photosynthesis and increase its efficiency here we will proceed further let's see the arrangement of photosynthetic pigments we have talked much about various type of pigments like chlorophyll and various other pigments now let's see how are these arranged uh, here just take the diagram arrangement of photosynthetic pigments here we can see you can see here there is a phospholipid bilayer the first thing you can see here is the phospholipid bilayer that you have already studied in cell chapter this bilayer this bilayer of phospholipids is actually the membrane of thylakoid it is the thylakoid membrane as i have already told you that the pigments of photosynthesis are present in the thylakoid membrane so here you can see two different colors one is this and the other one surrounding it the thing present here in the center here this thing is called the reaction center complex and the things surrounding it you can see here different color these surrounding things are called light harvesting complex actually these complex help to trap sunlight in a better way and both of these reaction center complex and light harvesting complex are, are together known as photosystem so what is a photosystem it consists of the reaction center complex and light harvesting complex. Here there is an overview of the starting phase of photosynthesis that you can see here that photon of light comes here and is absorbed by the pigments present in the light harvesting complex. Here these pigments transfer the energy of photon to the uh, adjacent pigments and they ultimately transfer them to a special pair of chlorophyll A molecules. It is known as the reaction center, this thing. This thing. It contains of, it consists of a special pair of chlorophyll molecule. Why special? Because in next sections, you will see that photosystems are of two types, photosystem one and photosystem two. And the main difference will be the type of chlorophyll A molecules, they will absorb different wavelengths of light more clearly. So here, what you have seen? Here, I want to say that photosynthetic pigments are arranged in a specific way in the thylakoid membrane. These are present in the form of light harvesting complex, which surround the reaction center complex. Let's proceed further. 
so what we have already seen about the photosystem that is that it is composed of a reaction center complex reaction center complex surrounded by several light harvesting complexes photosystem consists of a reaction center complex you can see it in the previous diagram here just to wait i will show you here it is the reaction center complex reaction center complex which is surrounded by various light harvesting complexes so photostem is composed of a reaction center complex surrounded by several light harvesting complexes the reaction center complex is an organized association reaction center complex is an organized association of proteins holding a special pair of chlorophyll a molecules so various type of proteins hold a special pair of chlorophyll a molecule each light harvesting complex consists of various pigment molecules uh, you should know that light harvesting complex are those pigment that surround the reaction center complex and this complex consists of various pigment molecules which may include chlorophyll a b and carotenoids bound to proteins you should clarify one thing here that here in the reaction center complex in the reaction center complex the core will be formed by a special pair of chlorophyll a molecule but chlorophyll a b carotenoids and other pigments may also be present in the light harvesting complex but they have different role the central role is performed by this pair of chlorophyll a molecule which is present in the reaction center complex i think you have understood it well so let's proceed further types of photosystem photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 actually you should know that photosystem 1 and 2 are named in the sequence of their discovery photosystem 1 is discovered before the photosystem second so they are named like this but during the process of photosynthesis photosystem 2 starts working before the photosystem 1 so here is a misconception usually developed by many students you should make it clear that photosystem first and second are named after their sequence of discovery not according to their role in photosynthesis in the process of photosynthesis photosystem 2 starts working first and then the photosystem 1 starts to do its work okay photosystem 1 its reaction center is composed of a pair of chlorophyll a molecules which are based at absorbing light having a wavelength of 700 nanometer so this reaction center is called p700 p4 photosystem and 700 for the wavelength of light that is absorbed based and the reaction center of photosystem 2 contains a pair of chlorophyll a molecule which are based at absorbing light having wavelength 680 nanometer so its reaction center is called p680 you may be thinking about a question that why chlorophyll a molecule here is based at absorbing light at 700 nanometer and here at 680 nanometer despite having same molecular structure why is this difference actually this is not the difference of chlorophyll a these both molecules are identical but the difference is caused by the surrounding protein molecules which hold these pigments so the chlorophyll a of photosystem 1 reaction center absorb light at 700 nanometer wavelength at best and here at 680 nanometer we should proceed further we will see the role of both these photosystems photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 during the mechanism of photosynthesis here the mechanism of photosynthesis photosynthesis is a multi step process which is completed in two phases just remind you that 
the chemical equation that we use to describe the process of photosynthesis is not just a real equation it is a simplified form of a multi-step process photosynthesis is a complex process which contains of many steps and several substates the phases of photosynthesis are completed in two different phases light reaction and dark reaction Light reaction converts solar energy into chemical energy and dark reaction uses this energy to reduce CO2 into simple sugar. What is the ultimate goal of photosynthesis? The ultimate goal of photosynthesis is to convert CO2 into usable sugar. We will take example of glucose. So this is the ultimate goal of photosynthesis. During this process of converting CO2 into sugar, we will need various things like electron donor or energy provider molecule. So in the process of light reaction, in the process of light reaction, sunlight is converted. The energy uh, obtained from sunlight, that is solar energy, is converted into chemical energy. In, uh, actually, this chemical energy is stored in molecules like ATP and NADPH. These molecules provide the required things in the next step that is dark reaction in which CO2 is reduced into C6H12. Actually, it is not C6H12O6. We take it just for convention. We will see in detail what is formed here. The one thing you should know here that dark reaction is a misnomer. Dark reaction is a misnomer. It is a wrongly coined term. Dark reaction doesn't mean that it is uh, it occurs in dark or in absence of sunlight. No, it is actually light independent reaction. It doesn't directly depend upon sunlight. Light reaction directly depends upon sunlight. But dark reaction depends upon the products formed by light reaction. So dark reaction, the term dark reaction is a misnomer. It is also known as biosynthetic phase, light independent reaction and various things. So we should proceed further from here to see the mechanism in detail. Here. We will discuss light reaction. It is also known as a Hill's reaction according to discovery. And photochemical phase. What is photochemical? Photo means light and chemical you already know. It is also known as photochemical phase. It takes place in the thylakoid membrane. Light reaction takes place in the thylakoid membrane. It converts solar energy into the chemical energy of ATP and NADPH. As we have discussed before so in the light reaction solar energy is trapped and is converted into chemical energy which is stored in molecules ATP adenosine triphosphate and NADPH the process of light reaction involves various steps for our convention we can uh, say it involves these three steps photo excitation of chlorophyll it means the excitation of chlorophyll molecules with the use of sunlight. The another thing it consists is splitting of water. And the next thing is photophosphorylation. What is photophosphorylation? Phosphorylation means addition of phosphate group. What is phosphorylation? Photophosphorylation uh, means addition of addition of phosphate group addition of phosphate group and this is carried out with the help of sunlight so it is called photophosphorylation actually in this process inorganic phosphate is added with ADP to form ATP so it is called photophosphorylation and sunlight helps to uh, carry out this process. Let's see 
the further things in quite detail. Here you can see a overview of the entire process of light reaction. Don't get puzzled up by this whole complex diagram. I will make it clear. Just keep on listening with full attention. Here you can see photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. Here you need to listen very carefully to understand this whole thing. Uh, just listen carefully. Here you can see photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. The whole process starts with the striking of sunlight on the accessory pigments. These molecules absorb the energy of sunlight and transfer to the surrounding pigments. This energy is ultimately transferred to the uh, chlorophyll A molecules present in the center. And the chlorophyll A molecules in the reaction center of photosystem 2 is P680. These molecules absorb the energy of sunlight and get excited. Due to the excitation of molecules, the electron in its outermost orbital just jump off and escape these molecules, leave these molecules. So now the chlorophyll molecules have lost one electron. So there is one positive charge on this molecule. Let's uh, recap this point from the beginning. Here you have seen that light has striked the accessory pigments. The energy is absorbed and is transferred to the surrounding pigments. Ultimately, this energy is transferred to the chlorophyll A molecules, which upon absorbing this energy get excited. And due to this excitement, the electron from its outermost shell escapes out. This escaped electron is accepted or caught by a molecule called primary acceptor. This primary acceptor molecules, this primary acceptor molecule catches the electron which is coming from P680. Now, here one very important thing takes place. Due to the loss of electron, this chlorophyll in the center has become unstable. It has got one positive charge since one negative charge has been lost. So it has become very strong oxidant. It will oxidize anything and uh, it will try to gain its stability. So what happens here? Splitting of water takes place. Splitting of water takes place. Here I am giving you just a brief overview of the entire process. Later we will discuss each step here. You can see the step 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. In the consecutive uh, slides you can see, you will be able to see the whole thing described in detail. Here I am giving you just a brief overview to learn things in a more simpler way. So what we have talked earlier that light energy is absorbed by the accessory pigments transferred to the chlorophyll molecules, chlorophyll excites and losses its electron which is accepted by primary acceptor and now the chlorophyll molecule after losing its electron tries to gain, tries to regain its stability. Here water molecule is splitted, water molecule splits and oxygen is involved here electron is supplied to the chlorophyll molecule to make it stable again so what happens here chlorophyll molecule which has lost its stability by uh, losing this electron has regained its electron from h2o 
the oxygen released here will be released out from the cell and the hydrogen ions H plus ions produced here will be pumped inside the membrane of thylakoid the lumen of thylakoid here you can see if this is a thylakoid if you have not learned the structure of thylakoid then you will find it somewhat difficult so I will suggest you to go back and see the structure of chloroplast where I have discussed about the structure of thylakoid here just think it is a thylakoid whole reaction that we are seeing here is carried out in the membrane of thylakoid during this process the H plus ions are produced and these ions are pumped inside the lumen here you can see various H plus ions getting accumulated inside the lumen of thylakoid in the empty space of thylakoid in the next stage we will see what is the use of these H plus ions why these are being accumulated here so let's again see what has happened here light energy is transferred to chlorophyll this molecule gets excited and the outermost electron is escaped out escapes out from its orbital and is accepted by a primary acceptor here the chlorophyll became unstable and regained its stability after the splitting of water molecule now we'll proceed further the electron that escaped from here let's just uh, make the things more clear so here so electron escaped from the outermost orbital of chlorophyll and accepted by primary acceptor next you know that electron can never uh, can never remain in free state without losing its energy so the electron which had a high amount of energy starts losing its energy and falling down in the energy scale it is transferred to another molecule plastoquinone and several other molecules that take this electron and uh, transfer it forward so electron is being transferred from plastoquinone to cytochrome complex to plastocyanin these molecules take electron these molecules take electron and proceed it further so electron is losing its energy electron is losing its energy and this electron is falling down in the energy scale what is being done here the energy the energy released by electron the energy released by electrons is used for the synthesis of ATP used for the synthesis of ATP here the synthesis of ATP is another step that will uh, be discussed in detail and the process of synthesis of ATP here we will learn about a process known as chemiosmosis chemiosmosis don't get bothered by this term it will be clarified in detail so what you see here the electron that jumped off the orbital of uh, the chlorophyll A of photosystem 2 is accepted by primary acceptor and is transferred to various other things that constitute the electron transport chain as the transport electron through this chain the energy is being continuously released by the electron and this energy is used for the synthesis of ATP so here we can see the formation of it now this electron will proceed further and simultaneously another thing is happening here so just stop this electron here and we will see we will firstly see what is happening here in the photosystem one then we will continue this electron being transported in this chain here as light strike the accessory pigment of photosystem 2 similarly the 
accessory pigments of photosystem first are also striped by light similarly light energy is transferred ultimately to the chlorophyll a molecules and here the chlorophyll a molecules of p700 are here there is a difference here chlorophyll molecules were p680 and here p700 these molecules absorb the energy of sunlight and the similar things similar thing happens that the electron gets excited and leaves the orbital leaves the outermost orbital and is here accepted by primary acceptor so similarly as we have seen earlier that this chlorophyll a had become positively charged and it regained its stability by accepting the electrons which came from h2 here the similar thing will happen but h2 will not come here here after electron jumps off the orbital this chlorophyll becomes similarly unstable it will have one positive charge and the electron that was coming from photosystem 2 the electron that escaped from reaction center of photosystem 2 and transported through the electron transport chain ultimately reaches here the chlorophyll a molecules of photosystem first now this chlorophyll which had become unstable now regains its stability by accepting electron by accepting electron so electron lost here is now replenished by the electron which came from photosystem 2 now we will see what happened to the electron which escaped the photosystem 1 here the electron which had escaped the photosystem 1 reaction center is accepted by the primary acceptor molecule of ps1 the primary acceptor molecule again transports the electron transfers the electron in the second electron transport chain it was the first electron transport chain and here it is the second electron transport chain in this second electron transport chain this electron is captured by ferredoxin here you can see fd and ultimately ultimately this electron is this electron is transferred to here an enzyme you can see NADP plus reductase this enzyme helps to form NADPH with the help of previously existing molecule it was present here from the beginning NADP plus some H plus are also used some H plus are also used here and ultimately NADPH is formed the process of formation of NADPH will be discussed in more detail and this section will become clear soon here i am not discussing it in detail to make to keep it simple but in the next section you will be able to understand the exact process that is used for the synthesis of nadph and atp let's summarize the whole thing what we see here we see two photosystems photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 in photosystem 2 light energy is absorbed by the accessory pigments transferred to chlorophyll molecule which excites electron and electron jumps off orbital which is carried forward here water is splitted and electron is supplied to make chlorophyll molecule stable and the electron that escaped it ultimately reaches the reaction center of photosystem 1 which earlier became unstable due to loss of electron due to loss of electron and it again it again becomes stable by receiving the electron from ps2 and this electron which escaped from the p700 molecule of chlorophyll this electron is used for the formation of an adph the whole thing the whole thing looks like the alphabet z so this whole step is also known as Z scheme. In the upcoming sections, we will also see some variation of this process 
sometimes only one photo system remains functional and it is it doesn't work like this z then that at that time it works like a cycle in this process atp is being produced in this jet scheme which is a non cyclic so it is called a non cyclic photophosphorylation photophosphorylation and in the second type which we, uh, which we will discuss further the atp will be formed in a cyclic process that will be called cyclic phosphorylation so just take uh, step by step just we will see the whole thing we will discuss the steps in more detail here just to remind you that here i have marked the steps like step 1 step 2 step 3 which will be uh, used in the next consecutive slides 4 5 here what is in 4 electron transport chain in 5 synthesis of atp in the point number 6 we will see the striking of light on the accessory pigments of ps1 in the point 7 we will see the second electron transport chain and in the point 8 we will see the formation of an atph molecule let's proceed here now what we have seen till now is now going to be discussed in detail the first step that we saw is the photo excit excitation of chlorophyll a of ps2 that is p680 in this process a photon of light strikes a pigment molecule in a light harvesting complex of ps2 boosting one of its electron to a higher energy level what happens here you have already seen that light strikes the accessory pigment of ps2 and its electron is boosted to a high energy level by absorbing the light of solar energy uh, by absorbing the energy of sunlight as this electron falls back to its ground state an electron in a nearby pigment molecule is simultaneously raised to an excited state this is due to the transfer of energy that uh, i have discussed before that the neighbor molecules the surrounding molecules are given uh, are provided with this energy the process continues with energy being relayed to the other pigment molecules until, until it reaches the p680 pairs of chlorophyll a molecule in the ps2 so as we have seen earlier as we have seen earlier that just to take the example from this slide so what we see in the f in the first step just wait uh, the slide escaped here in the first step light energy has striked here and electron escaped and this electron ultimately reaches here the center of ps1 so what happens here the process continues with the energy being relayed and this energy is used to excite the p680 pair of chlorophyll molecules in the ps2 it excites an electron in this pair of chlorophylls to a higher energy state now we will see the point number two what is in this point point number two let's see uh, the diagram here you can see in the point number two it is the primary acceptor molecule captures the electron that escaped the reaction center of uh, ps2 so we will see it here in detail here there is one thing this diagram will make the concepts more clear here you can see the light energy has striked and reached the chlorophyll molecule and electron has escaped from it to excited state and it is releasing its energy in the form of heat and other things like fluorescence. So uh, we will proceed to the next slide.
transfer of electron to the primary acceptor the electron that escaped the reaction center of photosystem 2 is transferred to the primary electron acceptor and the excited reaction center due to the loss of electron is now called p680 plus why plus because it has lost a negative charge so it has become positive in the third step that is the splitting of water it is a very important step an enzyme catalyzes the splitting of water molecule into two electrons two hydrogen ions and one oxygen atom photolysis of water requires some minerals like these all the minerals which i have written here are required in the process of photolysis of water the electrons are supplied one by one to the p680 pair of chlorophyll you should know that these are chlorophyll molecules each electron replacing one transferred to the primary electron acceptor as we have seen earlier that chlorophyll became unstable by the loss of electron so this loss of electron is replenished by the electron that is supplied by the photolysis of water here there is another important thing p680 is the strongest biological oxidizing agent known it is a very strong oxidizing agent so it snatches off it takes away the electrons of a split water molecule and the hydrogen ions the h plus ions produced here are released into the thylakoid lumen as I have talked earlier this uh, accumulation of H plus atoms will be used during the production of ATP we will discuss it later in great detail just uh, remember it till then the oxygen atom immediately combines with another oxygen atom generated by the splitting of another water molecule forming O2 and in this form it is evolved let's proceed further i think you have learned the process of splitting of water molecule now the thing begins is the electron transport each photo excited electron passes from primary electron acceptor of ps2 to ps1 as you have seen in the diagram through an electron transport chain so the electron passes from the reaction center of ps2 ps2 to ps1 through firstly uh, it is captured by the primary electron acceptor then various molecules cytochromes and again it reaches the center of ps1 as we have seen earlier the electron transport chain between ps2 and ps1 is made up of the electron carrier plastoquinone and a cytochrome complex and protein called plastocyanin so these things are present in the electron transport chain actually they are just like carriers which receive electron and transfer it forward let's proceed here comes the very important step that is photophosphorylation that is the synthesis of a tp molecule the exergonic fall of electrons to a lower energy state provides energy for the synthesis of ATP. What is exergonic? Exergonic means releasing energy. So while electrons continue to travel through the electron transport chain as from, it, uh, from PS2 to PS1, from PS2 to PS1, throughout this electron transport chain the electrons continue to release energy and this energy is used for the synthesis of ATP as we have talked earlier the electron passed through the cytochrome complex H plus are pumped in the thylakoid lumen you must remember I have talked it earlier that whole process of light reaction takes place in the membrane of thylakoid here you can see the red color membrane i have drawn it in red color whole process continues in the on the membrane of thylakoid and the h plus ions produced by the splitting of water 
are pumped into the lumen and it causes a increased an increased concentration of H plus ions in the lumen. As electrons pass through the cytochrome complex, H plus are pumped into the thylakoid lumen, contributing to the proton gradient. Here it's a gradient, gradient means difference. So here protons are accumulated and it causes the proton gradient that is subsequently used in chemiosmosis to synthesize ATP. So let's learn what is actually chemiosmosis and how these H plus ions accumulated in the lumen help in the formation of ATP. Let's proceed further. Here there is a detailed diagram to make you understand the whole process. Now you can see here the things that you are already familiar with. Here you can see photosystem 2, here you can see photosystem 1 and here you can see that light energy has striked here and electrons so passes here through the electron transport chain and reaches the photosystem 1 and during the process H2O H2O is split and supplies electrons and the hydrogen ions produced are uh, pumped into the are here present in into the lumen H plus ions are present in the lumen and also the energy of electron is also used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma into the lumen of thylakoid so in the lumen of thylakoid H plus come from two sources that is from the splitting of water and from outside pumped from the outside all this leads to an increased concentration of H plus ion inside the lumen of thylakoid here just to make it clear i will use another slide just to wait for a second uh, in the next slide just uh, here just wait so what we have seen till now is that inside the lumen of thylakoid what you can see here this large diagram is of a thylakoid this is the membrane of thylakoid that you can see here the phospholipid bilayer surrounding everything it is a this thing is a thylakoid what is this this is a thylakoid and in the lumen of thylakoid h plus ions are accumulated this gradient of h plus ion or proton gradient drives the synthesis of ATP. How does it occur? Actually, the membrane of thylakoid contain ATP synthetase, ATP synthetase or ATP synthase. This enzyme, this enzyme works by the, just take another example to make it clear. You can see here various H plus ions are trapped inside the lumen of thylakoid. Here, H plus ions are trapped in the lumen of thylakoid. Many H plus ions have accumulated here due to the splitting of water and pumping of H plus ion inside. So, due to this gradient, these H plus ions will try to escape out due to the gradient, but they will not find a way for escaping out. And the way they will form, they will found is through the ATP synthase. So they will enter inside it and will travel through it to reach the outside of thylakoid that is into the stroma. And this pumping out of H plus ions, this pumping out of H plus ions from the lumen of thylakoid into stroma causes the combination of ADP with inorganic phosphate and one molecule of ATP is formed. Here total three H plus ions are used to synthesize one ATP molecule. The whole process described here is known as chemiosmotic hypothesis. Chemiosmotic 
hypothesis. Chemi means related with chemical and osmosis you already know. Here this gradient of H plus ions is used to drive this ATP synthase which ultimately re uh, results in the formation of ATP molecule. So I think you have learned about the process of ATP synthesis. Let's proceed. Actually the whole process of photosynthesis is quite detailed and if you are getting confused just pause and go back from where we have started light reaction. If you repeat the things and try to understand more carefully the whole thing will become clear to you. Let's proceed further. So after the formation of ATP now we will see the photo excitation of chlorophyll A of photosystem first. Photosystem first. Let's just show you the diagram again from where we began this whole process. Here we have already discussed one. I just wait uh, the slide wait, here. So we have already discussed the step first this step was actually of the photo excitation of photosystem 2 after that we discussed the point second the point third of photolysis of water the point fourth of electron transport chain the fifth point was discussed just now it was the chemi osmosis process chemiosmotic hypothesis that result chemiosmosis which resulted in the formation of ATP molecule. Now we are going to discuss the sixth point that is here you can see the light strikes here and ultimately it excites the reaction center of photosystem 1. So we are now going to discuss this point number 6. Let's go to the here. Here you can see, meanwhile light energy has been transferred via light harvesting complex pigments to PS1 reaction center complex. It excites an electron of the P700 pair of chlorophyll A molecules. Similarly, uh, you can relate the whole process with the PS2. Here we are uh, discussing about PS1 and the whole thing described earlier with the photosystem 2. It is happening similarly with photosystem 1. It excites an electron of P700 pair of chlorophyll A molecules. The photo excited electron leaves the chlorophyll A molecule and is accepted by the primary electron acceptor of photosystem 1. Now this chlorophyll lacks one electron since it has lost one and is called P700 plus due to the positive charge. This deficiency is fulfilled by the electron of PS2 that has traveled down the electron transport chain. Earlier, in the PS2, photosystem 2, the deficiency of electron was fulfilled by the photolysis of water. You have already seen that the photolysis of water supplied electrons to the photosystem 2. And the electrons that escape photosystem 2 now reaches photosystem 1 to fulfill the de deficiency of electron that has occurred here. So we should proceed further. The second electron transport chain, the photos excited the photo excited electron that leaved the chlorophyll A of PS1 and was accepted by the primary electron acceptor of PS1 now travels down the ATS through the protein ferredoxin. Just see the Mm, slide here point number seven so what is here in the point number seven you see this is the second electron transport chain this is the second electron transport chain and this electron travels through ferredoxin and will be used in the next state that is step eighth with the use of NADP plus reductase enzyme so just reach that point now the second electron transport chain photo excited electrons that 
leaved chlorophyll A of PS1 and was accepted by the primary electron acceptor of PS1 now travels down the ATS through the protein phyllidoxin as you have seen just now. ATP is not synthesized in this electron transport chain. It is a very important point that ATP is synthesized only during the first electron transport chain. Let's make it clear with the diagram. Here you can see that ATP synthesis takes place only here, only here and it is through the first electron transport chain. It is the first electron transport chain. Here ATP is being synthesized but during the second electron transport chain ATP is not synthesized. You can not see any synthesis of ATP occurring here. So it was the point that we were seeing. Here let's move to that point. ATP is not synthesized in this electron transport chain. It is a very important point. Let's proceed further to the point eighth. Synthesis of NADPH. The photo excited electron is transferred from ferredoxin as we have seen earlier to NADP plus. NADP plus is present here. So this electron reaches NADP plus by the help of enzyme NADP plus reductase. The enzyme which helps in the reduction of NADP plus is called NADP plus reductase. NADP plus is reduced to NADPH by the addition of two electrons received from ferredoxin and one H plus ion obtained from stroma. Here you can see the steps. Here NADP plus gets one electron so this charge is nullified and it becomes an ATP now this an ATP gets H plus and E minus so if we combine H plus with E minus it forms H and now this H gets attached with an ADP and forms an ADPH so here the formation of an ADPH takes place and uh, here is one important point that an ADP plus reductase enzyme which helped in the whole process that we see here is located on the stroma side of thylakoid membrane. Stroma side means just imagine if this is a chloroplast and if this is a thylakoid then this will be the lumen side of thylakoid and this will be the stroma side of thylakoid membrane. So it will be located here on the stroma side of thylakoid membrane. Just proceed further. Here there is a very interesting summary of light reaction. It is very interesting just see here. And compare this diagram compare this diagram with the first diagram that I have been using throughout this light reaction. This diagram is the actual diagram and now I am going to show you this diagram is the very interesting diagram that will make you understand the whole process of light reaction very clearly. Here you can see that photon, photon strikes here. And photosystem, from photosystem 2 electron jumps due to this strike electron jumps and is accepted by the primary primary electron acceptor primary electron acceptor accepts it catches it and transfers it through the electron transport chain it is the electron transport chain and here a mill is located which uses the energy being released by electron. What is this mill? This is actually the process of chemiosmosis. This is actually the process of chemiosmosis. And you can see here the electrons are rolling down and the energy is used by this mill to produce ATP. Energy is used to produce ATP. Okay. So now this electron ultimately reaches the 
photo system first this electron ultimately reaches the photo system first and it has already helped in the synthesis of ATP now when it reaches photosystem 1 before this just before this what has happened here is that photon has striked here similarly like it is striked photosystem 2 and electron has escaped from electron has escaped from photosystem first to the primary electron acceptor and this deficiency of electron this deficiency of electron is fulfilled by the electron which came from the ps2 this deficiency is fulfilled here and the electron that was accepted by the primary electron acceptor here is again transferred to ferredoxin after that the enzyme NADP plus reductase helps in the formation of NADPH so it's a very interesting diagram uh, which helps to understand the light reaction in easy way you can see here the two molecules are formed ATP and NADPH the next thing that occurs after light reaction is the dark reaction dark reaction actually uh, uses ATP and NADPH for the synthesis of uh, food that is glucose or we can say sugar. Let's proceed. Now before discussing dark reaction we will discuss another way of ATP production that is cyclic photophosphorylation what is cyclic photophosphorylation earlier we have seen that during the process during the whole process of light reaction two photosystems work two photosystems continue to work uh, that are photosystem second and photosystem first but sometimes only photosystem one works only photosystem one works and the process becomes just like cycle it uh, continues in a cyclic way so let's see what is cyclic way of ATP production that is the cyclic photophosphorylation let's reach to that point here so in certain cases photo excited electrons can take an alternate path called cyclic electron flow which uses only photosystem first not photosystem 2 the electron the electrons cycle back from ferredoxin to the cytochrome complex the whole thing will become clear when we see the diagram of cyclic photophosphorylation just see the theory what is written here the electrons cycle back from ferredoxin to the cytochrome complex and they are sent back to the chlorophyll of ps1 so only chlorophyll so only photosystem 1 is functional here and the electrons are cycled back to it this cycle continues so it is called cyclic photophosphorylation there is no production of NADPH and no release of oxygen cyclic flow does however generate ATP ATP is formed here cyclic photophosphorylation may occur in stroma lamellae you have already seen what is stroma lamellae since it has only photosystem 1 stroma lamellae doesn't contain photosystem 2 so cyclic photophosphorylation occurs here let's see what is cyclic photophosphorylation through a diagram here you can see it more clearly let's see this is the whole diagram you have already seen of light reaction but other things are just uh, dim these things are deactivated here so shown in black and white or dimmed color and what you see here in a colorful diagram is that a cyclic flow of electron occurs here electron that leaves the reaction center of photosystem one is accepted by a primary electron acceptor it then uh, reaches ferredoxin cycled back through cytochrome complex plus to sign in and again it reaches the photosystem one and in this process ATP is produced since it 
continues in a cyclic way, this is called a cyclic photophosphorylation. However, the normal process of ATP form formation is through the Z scheme that we have studied earlier, that is non-cyclic way. That is non-cyclic way. It was the non-cyclic way. But what we are saying now is the cyclic way of ATP production. So there are two types of photophosphorylation that are cyclic and non-cyclic. Non-cyclic is more common and cyclic occurs sometime. We will see what is the use of cyclic photophosphorylation in the subsequent parts of this video. Let's proceed. Now we will see the process of drug reaction that is also known as the biosynthetic phase. It takes place in the stroma. Where was light detection taking place? It was taking place in the thylakoid membrane. Now the other part of photosynthesis that is the dark reaction takes place in the stroma that is the liquid present inside the chloroplast. Dark reaction can take place as C3 pathway, C4 pathway or CAM pathway. C3 pathway is more common. What is C3, C4 actually? In this process of uh, dark reaction, various intermediate substances are formed. In the cycle, various intermediate substances are formed. And after the addition of CO2, after the fixation of CO2, the first molecule that is formed in this step, the first molecule that is formed here contains three atoms of carbon. So the cycle is called C3 cycle, C3 pathway or Calvin cycle. It was discovered by Calvin, Melvin Calvin. So what is C3 pathway? It is a pathway in which the first stable product formed contains three atoms of carbon. In C4 pathway, the first stable product contains four atoms of carbon. And we will discuss CAM pathway later. It is found only in the succulent plants, the xerophytes that live in desert area. Calvin pathway is universal. Whether any plant uses C4 pathway or CAM pathway, it must include Calvin pathway or C3 pathway. So, Calvin pathway is universal in all photosynthetic plants. Carbon enters the Calvin cycle in the form of CO2. In the Calvin cycle, carbon enters in the form of CO2 and leaves in the form of sugar. So this cycle is responsible for the production of sugar. CO2 enters and what is produced here? Sugar is produced here. The cycle spins ATP from where it receives ATP. It receives ATP from the light reaction. This cycle spends ATP as an energy source and consumes an ADPH as a reducing power for adding high energy electrons to make the sugar. So both of these molecules ATP and NADPH are used here in the process of dark reaction. This cycle doesn't directly produce glucose. So as I said earlier it is not glucose that is formed here but a three carbon sugar a sugar containing three carbon atoms called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or short or in short it is called G3P so since G3P contains three carbons and two molecules of G3P can be used to form one molecule of glucose that we say in simple term. For the net synthesis of one molecule of 3GP, G3P, sorry, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, the cycle must take place three times fixing three molecules of CO2. So if we want to produce one molecule of one molecule of G3P, the cycle needs to take place three times and two molecules of 3G, G3P is used to produce one molecule of glucose. So, to produce one molecule of glucose, the cycle must take place six times. The cycle must take place six times. 
in three times it produces one one molecule of g3p and in the next three times it would it produces another molecule so both combined can form one glucose moving to the next step the steps of carbon cycle it consists of three phases carbon fixation or carboxylation reduction and generation of regeneration of co2 acceptor this is a very important step regeneration why it is regenerated because the plants need to continue this cycle in a continuous manner so the molecule that firstly receives co2 that is rubp needs to be cycled back this is regeneration the process starts with carboxylation which is in fact the most important step of calvin cycle let's see calvin cycle in detail here you can see carbon uh, sorry calvin cycle it includes three step the first step is first step is carbon fixation or carboxylation this step is known as carboxylation during this process co2 is received co2 is received and is combined with a molecule which is present here the molecule is rubp rubp combines with CO2 with the help of enzyme Rubisco. Rubisco enzyme helps to catalyze this process. Rubisco means RUBP uh, carboxylase oxygenase and it produces another compound. You must know that the whole process of Calvin cycle is very complex and contains many intermediate compounds. Here, what you see, this diagram is a simplified form of Calvin cycle in which only important intermediates are shown. So, the first stable product formed here is 3PG. What is PG? It is phosphoglycerate. We will see in the next sections. It is then finally reduced to form uh, G3P or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules. Some of these, actually many of these are transferred forward in consecutive reactions to regenerate RUBP which helps to continue this cycle and some molecules of G3P is used to form sugars and in the whole process you can see that ATP is being used here, ATP is being used here and also an ADPH is being used here. Let's see the process in detail through the steps. So the first step that is carboxylation. It is the most crucial step of Calvin cycle. In this state, CO2 is utilized for the carboxylation of RUBP, which has 5 carbon, to form two molecules of 3 phosphoglycerate or 3 phosphoglyceric acid 3PG. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco. What is Rubisco? Rubisco means RUBP carboxylase oxygenase. So, this reaction which reaction the combination of co2 with rubp is catalyzed by the enzyme called rubisco and this reaction produces 3 p g a 3 phosphoglycerate one thing to remember here rubisco is the most abundant protein on earth since plants cover a large portion of earth and each and every photosynthetic plant must contain rubisco so it is the most abundant protein on earth since the first stable product of calvin cycle that is 3pga contains three atoms of carbon 
this cycle is also known as c3 cycle so now it is clear that why is calvin cycle also called c3 cycle now moving forward to the next step reduction each molecule of 3pg receives an additional phosphate group from atp so atp do donates its phosphate group becoming 1,3 bisphosphoglycerate total 2 atp used here next one pair of electrons donated from an adph reduces this which also loses a phosphate group becoming g3p what happens here an adph help to reduce this into this g3p and here two and adph are used for every three molecules of co2 that enter the cycle there are six molecules of g3p formed for every three molecules of co2 that enter the cycle there are six molecules of g3p formed as we have talked earlier one molecule of g3p exits the cycle to be used by the plant cell in the form of various sugar like sucrose but the other five molecules are recycled to regenerate the three molecules of RUBP. Why? To keep the cycle in a continue, continuous manner. So, here you can see that G3P molecules are, just wait, some G3P molecules are used for the synthesis of sugar and some are sent back for the regeneration of RUBP molecules. Now proceed further. So in the regeneration step, the regeneration of RUBP is essential. In a complex series of reactions, the carbon skeletons of five molecules of G3P are rearranged by the last step of Calvin cycle into three molecules of RUBP. So RUBP is formed here in a complex series of reactions. To accomplish this step, the cycle spends three more molecules of ATP. So three more molecules of ATP are used here. The RUBP is now prepared to receive CO2 again and the Calvin cycle continues in this manner. So what we have seen till now is the entire process just summarize quickly in the light reaction solar energy was converted into chemical energy which was stored inside ATP and an ADPH next in the Calvin cycle ATP and an ADPH were used to form sugar in the form of uh, sucrose or the simple sugar that was that contained three carbon which was uh, finally used for the synthesis of other sugars okay so let's proceed further summary of calvin cycle just see the summary of calvin cycle here the input was 6 co2 output was 1 glucose 18 atp came here and 18 adp um, it, they became 18 ATP by losing 18 inorganic phosphate by losing inorganic phosphates and 12 NADPH came here which became 12 NADP so hence for every CO2 molecule entering the CO2 cycle three molecules of ATP and two NADPH are required for every CO2 molecule that entered the Calvin cycle three molecules of ATP and two molecules of NADPH are required. It is probably to meet this difference in the number of ATP and NADPH that the cyclic photophosphorylation take place. You must remember that in the process of cyclic photophosphorylation, only ATP were formed, not NADPH. And here you can also see that the number of ATP used are more than the number of an ADPH used. So, ATP are produced more in number by combining the process of cyclic photophosphorylation. 
if you don't remember what is this cyclic photophosphorylation then you must need to go back and learn the whole thing again from the light reaction i hope the things are clear so move further now we will see some limitations of c3 cycle some limitations of kelvin cycle what are the drawbacks what are the limitations the enzyme involved in the process of carboxylation that is rubis co can bind with both co2 and o2 here this is hidden in its name c4 carboxylase and o4 oxygenase so it can accept both co2 and oxygen at higher temperature or higher atmospheric concentration of oxygen the enzyme rubisco starts binding with oxygen instead of co2 this causes a major problem plants need co2 plants need co2 not oxygen but if the temperature rises or if the atmospheric concentration of oxygen increases or becomes high the enzyme rubisco starts binding with oxygen and it brings oxygen into kelvin cycle instead of co2 by adding oxygen with rubp rubisco initiates a wasteful process which causes a loss of co2 and atp so this is a major problem what's the problem if the temperature increases or if the concentration of co2 increases then rubisco starts bringing oxygen instead of co2 and it brings oxygen and combines it with rubp with the help of rubisco enzyme and this initiates a wasteful process which causes a loss of co2 and atp this process is called photorespiration photo means with the help of light and respiration since it causes a loss of co2 let's see what is photorespiration in brief here this is a very simple diagram of um, photorespiration you can see this process the whole process is completed with the use of three organelles chloroplast pyroxisome and the mitochondria uh, here oxygen enters and is accepted is combined with the rubp and it forms phosphoglycolate which forms glycolate and through various you can see here there is a chain of reaction which causes the loss of co2 here you can see here co2 is being lost and here you can see atp is being used so this process actually plant do not need uh, to uh, plant do not want to lose co2 during the process of photosynthesis since it is very useful and atp is uh, produced during light reaction but this process of kelvin cycle if uh, temperature increases if temperature increases or oxygen concentration increases then kelvin cycle uh, becomes a wasteful process since it initiates photorespiration which causes the loss of atp and co2 so some plants have uh, started another process to overcome this problem of photorespiration let's see what is that another process adaptation to overcome photorespiration many plants have got an additional mechanism to stop rubisco from bringing in oxygen so the problem was caused due to the binding of rubisco with oxygen and some plants have evolved an uh, additional mechanism which stops this wasteful process in these plants the first stable product of co2 fixation is oxaloacetic acid which is a four carbon compound which contains four atoms of carbon so this pathway is called c4 pathway you must remember that in c3 pathway or kelvin cycle the first compound contain three atoms of carbon so that was called c3 pathway 
Let's see what is this pathway, C4 pathway in detail. All the plants that show C4 pathway have a special type of arrangement of cells in the leaves. Such arrangement is called Kranz anatomy. What is Kranz anatomy? We will see. In C4 plants, there are two distinct types of photosynthetic cells, mesophyll cells and bundle sheet cells. Mesophyll cells and bundle sheet cells. Earlier in C3 plants, we saw that only one cell was responsible for photosynthesis that was mesophyll, mesophyll cell. But here you can see another type of cell that is bundle sheet cell. Bundle sheet cells are arranged into tightly packed sheets around the veins of the leaf, around the vascular bundles. Mesophyll cells are present between the bundle sheet and leaf surface. We will see this in diagram. Mesophyll cells are present in the in between the bundle sheet and leaf surface. So let's proceed to the diagram. Here in this diagram you can see Kranz anatomy in detail. See, This is a section of leaf. This is the upper surface of leaf that is the upper epidermis and this is the lower surface of leaf that is the lower epidermis. In between here these are the vascular bundles the veins of the leaf here the vein are surrounded the vascular tissue are surrounded by bundle sheet cells you can see these bundle sheet cells which surround the vascular bundles so they form sheet around the vascular bundles they are called bundle sheet cells and between the bundle sheet cell and epidermis of leaf are present mesophyll cells here you can see these are mesophyll cells so both of these cells work together to complete the c4 cycle so let's see what happens in the c4 cycle and how does it eliminate the process of photorespiration let's proceed Here you can see the process of C4 cycle. What happens here? You can see these are the mesophyll cell and the other are bundle sheet cell. So which cells are toward the outer environment? The mesophyll cells are in more close vicinity to the outer atmosphere and the bundle sheet cells are located inside. So CO2 is accepted here. CO2 is accepted here with the help of enzyme PEP carboxylase. PEP means phosphoenol pyruvate. Here, you must remember in the C3 cycle, the molecule with which CO2 combined was RUBP, but here it is PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate. And the enzyme which catalyzes this reaction is not Rubisco, this is PEP carboxylase. Actually, this process eliminates the problem that was being caused by the Calvin cycle. Actually, Rubisco had affinity with oxygen in the higher temperature or higher concentration of oxygen. But here, PEP carboxylase does not show any such affinity and it helps in the fixation of CO2 with PEP or phosphonyl pyruvate. Here the compound formed is OAAR oxaloacetic acid oxaloacetate which contains four atoms of carbon so this cycle is called C4 cycle. Oxaloacetate is converted into malate that means malic acid which is transferred into the bundle sheet cell. So these are the mesophyll cells so in the mesophyll cells CO2 is received and which forms malate. Malate is now transferred to the bundle sheet cells. So in the bundle sheet cells, what happens? This malate is converted into pyruvate. Some part of this forms pyruvate, which goes to recycle or regenerate phosphoenol pyruvate with the use of ATP. 
and it also releases CO2 and now the exactly same thing occurs that occurred in the C3 cycle that is the Calvin cycle here Calvin cycle operates and sugar is produced which is transported to the vascular bundle let's now learn how does this C4 pathway eliminate the problems that were caused by C3 pathway in C3 pathway we saw that Rubisco binded with oxygen and initiated the harmful process called photorespiration but here Rubisco is placed here Rubisco is placed here in bundle sheet cell Rubisco is placed here in the bundle sheet cell and bundle sheet cell does not directly receive CO2 the first fixation of CO2 the first fixation of CO2 occurs in the mesophyll cell with the help of enzyme PEP carboxylase that does not have any such problem uh, as that of the Rubisco so here in the second uh, during the second carboxylation process second fixation of CO2 RUBP combines with CO2 with the help of Rubisco and this time the Rubisco cannot receive oxygen directly from the environment so that harmful process gets eliminated here also one thing that you see here in this whole C4 pathway Calvin pathway is also operating that's why I said it earlier that Calvin cycle or C3 cycle is universal during C3 cycle it's the thing during C4 cycle it also constitute a part and the next we will see CAM pathway it is also operated there so I think C4 pathway is very clear to you now now proceed further steps of c4 cycle as we have discussed in detail i will just briefly go through this section the first step is carried out and um, carried out by an enzyme called pep carboxylase this enzyme adds co2 to pep phosphonyl pyruvate forming the four carbon product that is oxaloacetate PEP carboxylase has, has much higher affinity for CO2 than does Rubisco and no affinity for oxygen. So this eliminates the problem of photorespiration. Therefore, PEP carboxylase can fix carbon efficiently when Rubisco cannot. This is when hot and dry uh, and stomata are partially closed, causing CO2 concentration in the leaf to fall and oxygen concentration to rise. So if the problem, what was the problem? High temperature, high temperature and high oxygen concentration. In this situation, Rubisco starts to bring in oxygen, but PEP carboxylase continue to bring in CO2 even in this situation. So C4 cycle is beneficial. Let's proceed. In the second step, OAA is converted into four carbon compound like malate, which is transferred to bundle sheet cell through plasmodesmata. In the third step, the 4C compounds release CO2, which then enters Calvin cycle operating here. The same reaction generates pyruvate, which is transported to mesophyll cells for the regeneration of PEP using ATP. So let's see the whole process again. Here, the in the first step, CO2 is received, and with the help of PEP carboxylase, it combines with PEP to form OAA oxaloacetate, which converts into malate, and malate is transferred into bundle sheet cell, which forms CO2, and it also releases pyruvate. Pyruvate goes to regenerate PEP, and CO2 enters the Calvin cycle. So here I think the things are very clear to you in the third step what happens uh, CO2 is released which enters the Calvin cycle and just wait a moment.
here is here be aware so what happens here co2 enters kelvin cycle and what happens in the kelvin cycle sugar is produced and what is done by the pyruvate it is transported back to mesophyll cell for the regeneration of pep using atp atp is used here so let's proceed further here again you can see the whole pathway of c4 cycle to make it clear i will proceed further now here there is comparison of the c3 and c4 plant c3 and c4 cycle c3 and c4 plant here it is written c4 just to make it clear it is c4 written here and here c3 so first carboxylation occurs in c3 in mesophyll cell and in c4 also mesophyll cell if you find this comparison difficult then you need to go back and learn calvin cycle and c4 cycle again if you have understood c3 and c4 cycle very well then you will find this comparison easy calvin cycle takes place in mesophyll cell and here in c4 cycle the calvin cycle takes place in bundle sheet cell you must remember that the number of cells in which co2 fixation takes place in c3 cycle it was only mesophyll cell but here mesophyll plus bundle sheet primary uh, primary co2 acceptor is rubp in c3 cycle and phosphorinol pyruvate in c4 cycle number of atoms in the primary co2 acceptor here five and here three rubp has five atoms of carbon uh, Five, sorry five atoms and here three atoms uh, finally C, uh, primary co2 fixation product is phosphoglycerate and here it is oxaloacetic acid pga contained three atoms of carbon and oxaloacetic acid contain four carbon atoms number of carbon atoms in the primary co2 fixation product here three and here four enzyme responsible for primary co2 fixation here it is rubisco and in c4 plants it is pep carboxylase which is also known as pepco and cells which contain rubisco here mesophyll cell and here bundle sheet cell it helps to eliminate photorespiration so let's proceed further now we will see the another pathway that is cam pathway which is used in the xerophytes let's firstly understand its uh, full form that is crassulation acid metabolism what is crassulation since it was firstly discovered in succulent family crassulaceae the name uh, of this pathway was uh, kept as crassulation acid metabolism it is an adaptation found in xerophytes to min to minimize water loss the problem with xerophytes is that during the day time if we open their stoma if we open the uh, if they open their stomata to receive co2 it will cause the transpiration of water evaporation of water in very large amount and water will be lost so they have developed this adaptation the scam plants open stomata at night and use the enzyme pepco to fix co2 what they do they open stomata only during the night time and use pepco to fix co2 the first product oa is then converted to malic acid with the help of enzyme malic dehydrogenase now this occurs this all occurred during night time during day time this malic acid releases co2 which is used in calvin cycle to produce sugar so what is the benefit the benefit is that during day during day time they do not need to open their stomata to uh, get co2 they get co2 from the malic acid which was obtained during night time and during night time it is safe to open stomata since what will not be lost during night time since this pathway cam pathway helps xerophyte to minimize water loss 
I hope you have understood it well. Let's move further. Now we will see a summary of photosynthesis. Here you can see it very well that uh, this whole process contains light reaction and dark reaction. Light reaction uses light, H2O releases oxygen and produces ATP and NADPH which are used during Kelvin cycle to produce sugar by fixing CO2 and it sends back NAD plus and ATP. These things are very clear up to now. So we will uh, move further. Now we will discuss the factors that affect the process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is under the influence of several factors both internal and external. Internal factors are, are also known as plant factors. Internal factors are also known as plant factors. These are number, size, heads, and orientation of leaves, mesophyll cells, and chloroplast. If the number, size of uh, chloroplast uh, leaf will be more, then the rate of photosynthesis will obviously be higher. If the edge is higher, if the leaves are old, then the rate will be reduced. Internal CO2 concentration and amount of chloroplast. Internal factors depend upon genetic nature and growth of the plant. These two things determine the internal factors. Here we will discuss mostly about the external factors that are like atmospheric CO2 concentration, temperature, water, etc. Here you also need to uh, understand one thing is the Blackman's law of limiting factor. What does this law state? This law states that when a process depends on a number of factors, its rate is determined by the factor which is nearest to its minimal value. What does it mean? Just to take example, if uh, when a process depends on a number of factors, just like photosynthesis depends upon various factors like light, CO2 concentration, temperature, water etc in such process the rate of process is determined by the factor which is nearest to its minimal value we should take an example a more uh, real life example suppose that uh, you are assembling pain okay what you, you are saying pains and for this you have uh, what things are in pain there is a cap there is body and inside there is a refill okay so you have total five caps how many caps you have you have five caps how many body of pain you have suppose you have seven bodies and how many refills you have suppose you have 20 refills now how many pens you will be able to assemble here you will be assemble you will be able to assemble only five pens because you have only five caps you will be able to use only five body of pen and five refills and five cap to form total five pens so here you see that despite having 20 refills seven bodies you produced only five pain so this was present in the least amount hence it determines the rate okay so let's proceed further and learn the whole thing in quite detail here light photosynthesis is influenced by light quality light intensity and duration of exposure to light quality means which type of light is it monochromatic or polychromatic if monochromatic then which wavelength is more this is light quality light intensity and duration light is rarely a limiting factor since light saturation occurs at 10 percent of the full sunlight so light rarely limits the rate of photosynthesis 
there is one very important point increase in light intensity beyond a point causes the breakdown of chlorophyll and a decrease in photosynthesis let's see this graph here is light intensity and here is rate of photosynthesis if the intensity of light is increased the rate of photosynthesis increases and after reaching a saturation point it doesn't increase it remains constant and beyond this if we continue increasing the intensity of light then what will happen chlorophyll will be destroyed and the rate will subsequently down so let's proceed further now we will discuss about co2 concentration it is the major limiting factor of photosynthesis atmospheric concentration is 0.03 to 0.04% increase in concentration of co2 up to 0.05% can cause an increase in co2 fixation beyond this it may cause harm so the concentration of co2 is beneficial up to this co2 saturation points for c3 plants it is this and for c4 plants this is this current availability of co2 level the current atmospheric situation is limiting to the c3 plants this point is very important that uh, which is the major limiting factor co2 concentration is the major limiting factor for photosynthesis uh, let's move to another slide temperature dark reaction is more sensitive to temperature since it involves more enzymes and the enzymes are more sensitive to uh, temperature the light reaction is not that much sensitive to temperature but dark reaction is sensitive to temperature c3 plants have a lower temperature optimum than c4 plants so c3 plants can um, live well in lower temperature while c4 plants can um, live better in higher temperatures temperature optimum also depends upon the habitat of plants tropical plants have high temperature optimum and the plants adapted then the plants adapted to temperate climates so it also depends upon the habitat of plants let's proceed further water water has more indirect effect on the rate of food the water doesn't have uh, much direct effects uh, what are the indirect effects uh, of water on the process of photosynthesis? For example, water stress causes closing of stomata and wilting of leaves. And if stomata will close and leaves will wilt, it will automatically uh, decrease the rate of photosynthesis. So, water affects the process of photosynthesis indirectly. Till now, I hope if you have watched the whole video carefully, you must have understood the entire process of photosynthesis and this video is very very useful for those who are preparing for NEET AMS or any other uh, pre-medical exam so by investing few minutes you can learn the whole process of photosynthesis in a simple way if you find any difficulty in the Mm, whole process of photosynthesis or anything related with this video feel free to comment down in the comment section i will make it clear to you so uh, we have talked much about the whole process and uh, now if you have uh, enjoyed this video please like comment and also share this video with your friends to help them uh, as much as you uh, share this video it will help more and more uh, students more and more learners to learn the process and please subscribe to our channel for more and more videos in the uh, subsequent time thank you for watching